Hello everyone, Dr. Falls here, and today I'll be talking about how to annotate Sonny's Blues. So, you've all read the text and you discussed it, but now we're going to go deeper and look at, um, try to examine two pages of the text to get you in the right frame of mind for the coming text that we're going to read. So I'll be modeling uh, how to annotate two of the pages, the first two pages of Sonny's Blues. Now you will annotate two other consecutive pages, right? So, so please don't annotate the first two pages. I'll just send it back because I want two other pages. So there are three types of annotation that we're doing for this assignment. The first one is uh, we're using CF. Now, CF is a type of notation that people use in annotating. It means confer or compare with. Now, this is really important because as you develop as a reader and as a writer in English, it's important to establish patterns in the text. Uh, pattern recognition is perhaps the key the key element in interpretation. Once you realize that a specific word or specific uh, motif uh, or a specific phrase is being repeated and you could identify different passages where you can see that, uh, you'll be able to make a better statement about the text as a whole. The second type of annotation is uh, to identify a theme to write on the margin uh, a thematic resonance that you see in the two pages. And finally, uh, it's important to discover implied meaning. So when you read something and you notice, hmm, this seems interesting. There's something here between the lines. I'm not quite sure what it is, but let me make a note of it and try to articulate uh, if there's a meaning that's ambiguous or something that appears to have more than one meaning. Okay, so make sure to do this, uh, you know, right actually in the margins of your books. Uh, but when you turn in the assignment, you're, you're going to type it as you would a discussion post. Uh, okay, so... All right, so let's start off with the first paragraph of Sunny's Blues, right? And so what you see here is the beginning of the use of the word darkness. So it says, uh, I stared at it in the swinging lights of the subway car and in the faces and bodies of the people. And, sorry, typo there. And in my own face, trapped in the darkness which roared outside. Now it's interesting, well, you have the word it there. We'll see that the word it appears ambiguous. Although one might think that he's talking about the, the newspaper, ostensibly he's talking about the newspaper that he uh, finds out the news about his brother, uh, that it appears to imply something more. But you also have the word darkness. And the word darkness appears multiple times in the text. So in my annotation, I put CF. Darkness appears on page 56, 64, and 82. So let's take a look at page 64. Oh, wow. So now we're in this childhood scene. We're in the scene where uh, Sonny and the narrator are both children, and the parents uh, and elders seem to be talking about something, uh, something implied, something bad, but they don't uh, talk about it with the children. It remains something hidden. It says, uh, quote, then the old folks will remember the children, and they won't talk anymore that day. And when light fills a room, the child is filled with darkness. 
He knows that every time that happens, this happens, he's moved just a little closer to that darkness outside. The darkness outside is what the old folks have been talking about. It's what they've come from. It's what they endure. So Baldwin's implying something. Everything remains quite hidden, right? Uh, so it's important to see, to imagine what this might mean, right? And so since uh, it's talking about an African-American context, right, in the 50s in the United States, uh, and since we know about the memory of the, the father uh, losing the, his brother, right, the uncle, uh, in, a, in an attack, uh, it, it might be, well, it might be uh, talking about racial violence. It's unclear. But this, this is a darkness that seems to pervade the lives of the children, and they can't quite articulate it. So then in the second paragraph, it says, I was scared, scared for Sonny. He became real to me again. Which is interesting because he mentions the word real a second time in a very similar context. He says, quote, I think I may have written Sonny the very day that little Grace was buried, uh, his daughter. I was sitting in the living room in the dark. Uh oh, wow, okay. The dark comes again, right? I was sitting in the dark by myself. And I suddenly thought of Sonny. My trouble made his real. There's a lot to unpack there, right? So he's sitting in the dark by himself. And then he remembers being with his brother. And, I mean, if you go, if you go back to page 64, it seems to be going back to that scene of childhood. And what's tragic, right, is that it's only in suffering that Sonny's suffering becomes visible, becomes something that he, you know, remembers. That's interesting. And so there's the theme of unspoken anxiety. That's just the language I use. One could use uh, other terms. You see this with that image of the block of ice, right? Uh, a great block of ice got settled in my belly and, I, and kept melting there slowly all day long while I taught my algebra, class's algebra. It was a special kind of ice. And, and ice just sits there. It can't quite, um, doesn't quite know what to do with it, right? So when you think of ice, you might think of ice being blue. So it might, might be a reference to uh, the blues, but it's a kind of a, a blues that doesn't, doesn't come out, doesn't express itself. Okay, and so, so an example of implied meaning in the first page, he says, uh, I couldn't believe it, but what I mean by that is that I couldn't find any room for it anywhere inside of me. I had kept it outside me for a long time. And so, yeah, this, this appears to be uh, gesturing back to the first paragraph where he says, I stared at it in the swinging lights. Again, there's this ambiguous it, which uh, gestures towards perhaps that, that darkness uh, in childhood that they couldn't quite put a finger on as children. And what's interesting, right, uh, he also says that he couldn't find any room for it anywhere inside of me, right? It's something that he, he uh, actively represses. He actively doesn't want to engage with it. He doesn't want to uh, listen to it. And perhaps this is the source of maybe why he doesn't listen to his brother or why he can't communicate it. Because there's something in what the brother's communicating that references that that it, the it, that doesn't seem to, uh, he doesn't seem to be able to give it a name. 
So, so this is the second page of the text. And here's another example of, of, uh, of, of an image that if you read slowly and carefully, you know there's some implied meaning. It says, uh, it was the beginning of the spring and the sap was rising in the boys. A teacher passed through them every now and that, now and again quickly as though he or she couldn't wait to get out of that courtyard. So on the one hand, it's just, right, he's just describing something that he sees. Uh, uh, a teacher passed through them every now and again. But then he realized that perhaps the teacher is an image of the narrator, right? We know the teacher or the narrator is a teacher of algebra. And so maybe that's a, a mental image of what, you know, of his desire, right? Someone as a teacher, right, he's seeing these boys, which remind him of Sonny, and he wants to pass through them very quickly. He wants to, uh, there's something about, uh, you know, this sap that was rising in the boys that he, he doesn't want to uh, engage with. Uh, he's some, he's uh, avoiding this, right? So it's very interesting. There's there's a lot to be said here, right? Also, the it says a, a te pass through them. The teacher passed through them. The word pass through is used at the very end of the text uh, to imply um, the the blues performance pass through uh, time. The word pass through is used in the very last page of the text. So that's interesting as well. So uh, now when you have all this evidence that you've gathered and you, you got to make some kind of coherent uh, statement about it. So that's what I want you to do uh, for the second part of the assignment. So after you annotate two consecutive pages, with at least five annotations in total, write a paragraph using the information you found. So start that paragraph with a topic sentence, introducing the the key idea, right? So you're not you're not going to be able to write about everything you annotate, but you will find a key insight. I promise you that. And so articulate that key insight in the topic sentence. And using the evidence you found, especially how it, that part connects to other parts of the text, you'll be able to say something very, very sharp and insightful about the text. Yeah, so I hope, I hope you enjoy this activity. I hope you find some interesting, uh, interesting aha moments as you read. And I hope that this, this exercise becomes a model for how you'll read fiction from now on, right, as we move forward. Well, thank you very much and good luck. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you annotate. Take care. Bye-bye.